Welcome into the 49er Access Podcast. My name is Sterling Bennett, and we've officially reached Rams Week, week number two of the NFL season. And today we are going to be previewing the San Francisco 49ers against those hated in a big rivalry game against the Los Angeles Rams. Thank you for joining us today. I want to remind you to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You can always take back your like at the end of the video. And let's jump right into week two, Niners versus the LA Rams. The San Francisco 49ers come into Sunday at 1 p.m. at SoFi Stadium, a.k.a. Levi's South, with an eight-game regular season win streak on the line against the Rams. Obviously, Rams stands will point to what happened in the playoffs, but look, this isn't the playoffs, and the likelihood they even get there are slim to none, so hold on to your hats. Sunday is going to be quite the show. Again, Niners holding on to an eight-game win streak, trying to push that to nine games in a row this Sunday at SoFi Stadium. Niners obviously coming off a week one win against the Pittsburgh Steelers, and the Rams coming off a surprising win over the Seattle Seahawks, helping the San Francisco 49ers out in a big way during week one. So both teams coming in 1-0, and and just like Pittsburgh, just like previous games at SoFi Stadium, the Niners have turned this weekend into Levi South, expected to have 65%, if not more, Niner fans in SoFi Stadium. And the Rams are dumb <laughs> because they said, hey, we're going to wear our white jerseys. So you just gave the faithful, that being you, that being myself, and whoever else is going to go down there, they allowed us to red out their stadium. So if you're going down to Levi South, going down to SoFi Stadium, wear your red. And I don't know why you would do that. They, they basically waved the white fa flag, literally and figuratively saying, hey, um, you can come out and wear your red. The team's going to be wearing their home jerseys, um, which, again, is quite fitting, knowing how well we play down there during the regular season. So if you're planning on going down there or if you like to go down there, um, one, wear your red, but also use our promo code 49ers Access and save yourself $20 off your first purchase at SeatGeek.com and get your butt a seat at SoFi Stadium, Levi South wearing some red. And look, this is going to be a massive, massive game. Niners obviously have championship aspirations. They shown that during week one against Pittsburgh, just really crushing the hopes of the Steelers early in that game. And the Rams are in this weird quasi-rebuild, retool. They still have Matthew Stafford, Aaron Donald still there. A Cooper Cup, who is not going to play in this game, or in fact, the first four weeks of the season, he is still technically on the team, but again, not going to play on Sunday. So they still have three superstar type players on the roster, but by all intents and purposes, by all means, this is a retooling young roster of a bunch of guys who want to prove themselves. They play fast, they play young and they play exciting, so they're going to come out there and want to defend their home field for the second time in a row. And, and look, this is a game for both teams where San Francisco has a point to prove and say, hey, look, we are going to run through every team you put in our way. And for the Rams, this is their chance to kind of reestablish somewhat of a dominance over the NFC West. Obviously, Seattle and San Francisco being the favorite coming in, but of the four teams in the, in the division, they're the last one to win an actual Super Bowl, so they want to come out and prove themselves on Sunday, and this is going to be a clash of NFC West Titans and NFC West Showdown. Um, this is the first time the Rams are going to play Brock Purdy in his career, so there is so much you know, rivalry and history here, but also so much new to kind of be seen for the first time between these two hated rivals and really historic teams in the NFL, but... Let's focus on the Rams side of things. How can the Rams beat San Francisco? How can San Francisco beat the Rams? What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses coming into Sunday against the red and gold of the San Francisco 49ers? And if you're going to point to anybody to begin, uh, just like Mike Tomlin last week, Sean McVay this week, 
Uh, again, just like Tomlin, one of the best coaches in football, someone who we can point to and say they've won an actual championship. Uh, they've been to, or Sean McVay has been to two Super Bowls, winning one, uh, unfortunately, at the victim of the San Francisco 49ers during the NFC Championship game, which I'm sure still haunts us to this day. But he's won something. And for a coach that looked like he may be on, you know, on the outs wanting to retire, he's found a fire again and has this team ready to go. They're 1-0 on the year. And Sean McVay should have this team ready. Now, again, we know the history between McVay and Shanahan. Uh, they don't dislike each other, but it's definitely a, a friendly, you know, little big brother rivalry between Shanahan and McVay. And, you know, Shanahan's dominated so much in the regular season. McVay wants to kind of uppercut him and kind of get him back and end our current streak of eight straight wins. But look, McVay's a great coach, one of the best schemes, a, def a definitive Shanahan disciple uh, with their time in Washington with Mike and Kyle LaFleur and McVay. And look, when it comes to McVay, the next person below him is Matthew Stafford. Matthew Stafford, and again, it does feel like that San Francisco and the Rams have so many ties where Shanahan and Stafford, Shanahan wanted to acquire Matthew Stafford before drafting Trey Lance and didn't get him, and we know what happened afterwards, but Matthew Stafford is one of those players where he's really streaky, and whether it was in Detroit or now in Los Angeles, He's a player where one week he's he looks like a quarterback that can lead you to a Super Bowl. He looks like the 2021 Matthew Stafford where he's anticipating throws into windows that are really small and he's proving to be a franchise quarterback. And other weeks he's anticipating windows that aren't really there, throwing into double coverages and, and showing why he is consistently at the top of turnover-worthy plays when it's all said and done. So my first question would be, which Matthew Stafford are we going to get on Sunday? Is it going to be franchise quarterback cooking Matthew Stafford? Or is it going to be, you know, turnover prone, turnover worthy play Matthew Stafford? Which Matthew Stafford is going to show himself on Sunday at, at SoFi Stadium, Levi South? And, and, and one thing I point to is that Matthew Stafford against the Seahawks last week, he was eating up Seattle over the middle of the field. Six for eight, 81 yards. I mean, Matthew Stafford was essentially running a very Niners-like scheme, which makes sense. McVay and Shanahan very similar in how they like to call plays, but Stafford is a player that we've yet to see this from Brock Purdy. Well, Purdy's been an amazing player so far. Stafford is, you know, he, he can be the only reason the Rams win this game. And I do think for their offense, he is their only shot and chance that if, if, if he's not perfect, if he isn't having an A-plus Matthew Stafford day, the Rams have no chance. But if he's having one of those games where he's you know in different arm slots and in anticipating throws in small windows, um, he's going to have a strong day and give the Rams at least a chance. But again, going back to my, my point of he was eating Seattle up over the middle, Shall I introduce you to my friend named Frederick Warner, <laughs> um, the best linebacker in football? Shall I say hello to my friend Drake Greenlaw and even someone like Tawanoa Hufunga, who are dominant, and especially Fred Warner, over the middle of the field? Fred Warner is the best coverage linebacker since he was drafted when it comes to covering and guarding the middle of the field. Stafford is not going to be able to cook and really eat San Francisco alive in that area. The success there, if he has any, is going to be minimal, um, especially knowing that Cooper Cup is not going to be on the field. You don't have your best offensive weapon. And I know last week, and we'll get to Puka Nakua and, and Tutu Otwell and Van, Je and Van Jefferson, but it's not like the Rams have this amazing personnel or just like Pittsburgh last week, you want to give them a chance and say, hey, they could surprise us here. But in reality, on paper, San Francisco should uh, be able to walk out of this game with 30-plus points on offense and really crushing the Rams on defense. And so Matthew Stafford, uh, I, I have a hard time believing 
he's going to be able to have the same success against the Seahawks over the middle as he would against San Francisco this Sunday. The other thing is the right side of the field of Matthew Stafford's strong side um, or uh, non-blind side, you could say. Um, He struggled there. The numbers might say he didn't, but in reality, he did. Um, Six for 11, under 50% completion percentage or close to it. 126 yards, but in, in actuality, he had one big play for 44 yards. And again, those stats aren't abysmal. They're not awful. But I do think you were taking uh, a Seattle team that didn't have their number two cornerback in Devon Witherspoon that is, has a, a young a secondary trying to learn a new system. They've reverted back to the Legion of Boom defensive scheme than what they've run the past few years in Seattle. So there are going to be some bumps along the way. And you're looking at Mooney Ward, who last week lines up on the right side of the field if you're playing offense, uh, targeted six times, allowed one catch for 26 yards, one interception, and allowed the lowest passer rating throughout week one for cornerbacks at 5.6. We're talking about two areas in which Matthew Stafford targeted the most, having all pro-level players guarding them on Sunday for San Francisco. Um, it just seems like where the Rams had success last week is not a place where they were going to be able to find it this Sunday. Um, and unfortunately for the Rams, they don't really have any other strengths. This team is not a run heavy team. Uh, Cam Akers had 22 attempts last week for only 29 yards. Now he did score a touchdown, but Cam Akers had the worst yardage gained at negative 41 versus rushing yards expected. So what he was predicted to get was minus 41 yards, what he actually got. 22 point, 22 attempts, 29 yards. He averaged barely over one yard a carry against the Seahawks run defense, which really isn't that great. And now he's playing against Javon Hargrave and Eric Armstead and Nick Bosa being back after having his first full week of practice, um, the Rams are not going to be able to run the football. And for Cam Akers, he is somebody, his, his rookie season looked really good. Um, he looked like the next franchise running back post Todd Gurley in LA, but since then, he hasn't done much. He lacks awareness overall, isn't a good pass blocker, and really, he's, he's not a three-down running back. He is someone you point to and say, First and second down, but if you're averaging just over one yard a carry, you can't be on the field. And now you're playing a better run defense in San Francisco. Why would anybody, Rams fan or not, have faith that Cam Akers can actually have an impact on this game and be successful against the Niners' run defense? It just doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, San Francisco stymied and stopped and, and prevented Najee Harris from having over 50 yards last week. He's a much better runner. Jalen Warren, same thing. Like San Francisco stopped a much more uh, successful, much more stout run offense in Pittsburgh than they're playing on Sunday against the Rams. Then you have Kyron Williams. They're kind of third down back, 15 attempts, 52 yards, two touchdowns, much more successful uh, of an outing for Williams than Akers against Seattle last week. Um, he does seem to be more of their, their third down uh, back and kind of the, the passing down back. He's a much better pass blocker um, and really, in my opinion, has much better awareness than Cam Akers. But here's the thing. We know here in San Francisco in the Bay Area, the San Francisco 49ers defense is one of the biggest, you know, mauling, aggressive style of defenses. You have players that want to tackle, that look to tackle. Yes, we know Bosa and Armstead and Hargrave and even Drake Jackson coming off a three-sack day against the Steelers. Those guys are going to get theirs. But then you have Fred Warners and Dre Greenlaw, who's back at practice today. You even have players like Mooney Ward, who was one of the best run-defending cornerbacks in the NFL. And I haven't even mentioned Talanoa Hufunga just yet. And even players like Lenore, they want to defend the run very very well, and they pride themselves on doing such a thing. And Kyron Williams, he's small, 
not very elusive, and he's easy to tackle. He's not going to fight for extra yards. And so if you point to an area and say the Rams are not going to have any success where it's going to be on the ground running, which really wouldn't differentiate itself from every other Niners win against the Rams the past, what, four or five seasons here under the McVay and Shanahan rivalry. Uh, But besides them, uh, when you talk about how you win in the NFL against the San Francisco 49ers, and really the Niners play this way the best, whether it's Philadelphia or San Francisco, these are two of the best teams that win from the trenches out. They've built them their their teams that way, uh, and it shows every single every single week. And for San Francisco, they're playing a better Rams O line than last year, but it's not good enough, at least on paper and on the performance last week, to really you know give the Rams an edge or even lean in a way in their favor. As a unit. Not that great, although, again, improved. They are much better at pass blocking this year than previous seasons, or at least since Andrew Whitworth retired and went to work for Amazon. Um, The Rams' offensive line last week was the second highest graded pass blocking group with an 84.8 grade, according to PFF. Um, Matthew Stafford being the, I don't want to say elite, but being the star quarterback he is, was kept clean on 76.9, 77% of his dropbacks last week, and they only allowed five pressures on 41 dropbacks. My question would be, is that because the Rams' offensive line is just so good? Because on paper, they're really not. They're okay. But on paper, there there's no one there that stands out that makes me say, like, there's no Lane Johnson. There's no really an Aaron Banks or really even a Trent Williams or I can even say not even a Jake Brendel on the the, the roster. There really isn't a second-team all-pro player. It's a bunch of young players or solid guys you'd like to have that would be backups on our roster currently um, or rookies, right? My question would be, is it because the Rams' offensive line is so good or, or you know, overperformed against the Seahawks, or is it the Seahawks pass rush isn't as good as they expected it to be? Um, My likely answer would be it's the latter. Uh, The Seattle Seahawks couldn't get any pressure against the Rams, whereas San Francisco, while again playing against bad tackles, played against two really good guards in a solid center and had 30 pressures last week. Like, and he had five sacks. This this Niners defensive line, their pass rush, is not even in the same ballpark as the Seahawks. And by that I mean, while San Francisco is hitting home runs and doubles and triples, the Seahawks can't even make it into the field to play a game. The Rams' offensive line, this is their obviously biggest test of the season, but I could argue that as a whole, the Niners played a much better offensive line last week and totaled five sacks and 30 pressures and nine quarterback hits. So if you have to ask yourself, well, the PFF grades say this, I would point to and say, okay, and they played the Seattle Seahawks defensive line that couldn't get any pressures on Matthew Stafford. And we've seen the past, I don't know, four years here in San Francisco. Um, Nick Bosa likes to sack Matthew Stafford. And you're adding the best pass rusher on the open market during free agency in Javon Hargrave. Like, he is much better at pass rushing than he is run run defending, and he's already good there. And you added a double-digit sack player to this defense. Um, the, the Seahawks really don't have anybody that proven a lot of young guys, a lot of players to move around and figure things out as things go along, but San Francisco has three studs of pass rushers, and Drake Jackson had a career game last week. So I'm not buying into the idea of, well, PFF grade said this and said the Rams had a really good pass blocking grade. Play the Niners and call me. <laughs> like the Pittsburgh Steelers were saying, you know, we're going to the Super Bowl. We're going to win this game by 15 or, or 10 points. And San Francisco said, you're going to lose by 23, and you're going to like it. And it could have been a lot worse. So 
Um, I don't buy the PFF grades there, but to give them some credit, to give them some kudos, um, they are much better against the pass than the run. Uh, their left tackle, Alaric Jackson, this year, um, converted from guard last year, and while didn't play great you know, during the season last year, um, he is currently the, the third highest pass blocker uh, of linemen last week. 88.5 was his grade. But again, my question is, when you're playing against the Seahawks um, and you go from Seattle to San Francisco, what are the odds a second year starting left tackle, really year and a half starting left tackle, goes from Dremont Jones and I believe his name is Awusu for the Seahawks. Then you're playing Drake Jackson off a three sack game, riding high, feeling good about himself. And then Nick Bosa. Um, that's quite the step up <laughs> um, for Alaric Jackson to kind of continue that performance. And there's players like Steve Avila, who was really good last week, rookie out of TCU, 78 snaps played, zero sacks allowed, zero pressures, zero hurries, and zero quarterback hits. My mind would lean to saying, how does he perform against stunts when it's Armstead and Jackson, Armstead and Bosa, Hargrave and Bosa? Like We're talking nightmare scenarios for offensive linemen, especially young stars or a rookie like Steve Avila. And even Nick Bosa and himself, in five games against the Rams, just five games, 32 pressures, six per game. <laughs> We're doing math here. Six per game in 6.5 sacks. So Nick Bosa's averaging one sack, just over one sack in six pressures per game against the Rams. And the Rams offensive line only allowed five pressures last week. Nick Bosa is averaging a better day against the Rams than the entire Seahawks defensive line did against the Rams last week. And we're supposed to buy into the idea that this Rams offensive line is much stronger and Rams fans, and, and to give them credit, believe in this team. But I'm not buying into the idea that, oh my goodness, PFF said this and you play well against Seattle, so this must be true. Week ones are week ones. Um, and the odds are that the Rams had a fluke week one over the Seahawks compared to San Francisco having a fluke week one against the Pittsburgh. Um, those odds are much higher for the fluke leaning in the Rams direction on uh, during, <laughs> during the season. Um, so again, I want to give the Rams credit for the week they had against Seattle last week, but week ones are behind us now, folks. Um, the Rams are not playing the same defensive line. They're playing a much more aggressive, attacking, and unified in the way they play defensive line with a healthier Nick Bosa or a much more prepared Nick Bosa, not on a snap count, and a very, um, what's the word I'm thinking of, a very confident Drake Jackson. Uh, and look, let's be clear here. The San Francisco 49ers against the, the Steelers last week allowed seven points, got two turnovers, five sacks, eight tackle for losses, nine quarterback hits, and 30 pressures. And I'm not supposed to think they can't do the same, if not better, against the Rams. At least, like, yes, there were throws on the field. Kenny Pickett missed. There are ways to almost negate a defensive line pressure, right? We've seen San Francisco do the exact same thing against the Rams. When Jimmy Garoppolo snapped his ankle in 2020, what'd they do? Screen passes, dumb off, quick passes, just get the ball out of Jimmy Garoppolo's hand and don't let the pressure get to him. The Rams are not that style of offense, and they truly only have one player that can do that style of game, and that one player that can excel in the areas consistently is not playing on Sunday, that being Cooper Cup. And the other the other player being Tutu Watwell has had one really strong game in his entire career, but besides that, hasn't done much. So the proven commodity is where you're going to lean to in these areas. This isn't a, you know, the Niners were good for one year and the Rams are bad for one. San Francisco has been dominating this offense 
for the past four seasons and should have had that one win in the playoffs. It's not like San Francisco has been outmatched or games have been close. The average margin of victory through their eight-game win streak has been 10 points, two scores. San Francisco has, by all means, been really the better team on all fronts against the Rams besides one game, albeit the most important one in the playoffs. But there are some players to look out for when it comes to the Rams. I don't want to um, just forget they have an actual offense. Their offense is their strength. Their offense, if it can find success in certain areas, uh, can hang around at least for a little bit with San Francisco and, and, and at least make this game like 17-24 or 17-27. Like, San Francisco is going to win this game. They should win this game, but you have to give credit where it's due. Players like Van Jefferson, uh, Tutu Otwell, Puka Nakua, Tyler Higby, Ben Skoranek, um, these are all players that can hurt you at certain times. They're not the most consistent players, and the odds Puka Nakua and Tutu Otwell have back-to-back -back career games I just don't think are very high. Um, the Seattle secondary, we've seen Brock Purdy put up 40 points against it in the playoffs. Matthew Stafford, by at least historical context, is a much better quarterback than Brock Purdy. Um, and I would expect a quarterback like him to put up big numbers, no matter who's playing receiver for him. Uh, we've seen Matthew Stafford for the Lions put up 500 yards, 5,000 passing yards, albeit lose games in the process. But him not being the reason the Lions have lost games and even being the reason the Rams haven't lost games throughout his time as a quarterback in the NFL. So I would expect big numbers to be put up against Seattle secondary. Um, Brock Purdy's doing that stuff, and some of you don't even think he's that good. <laughs> so why wouldn't Stafford do that? But uh, Puka Nakua, he's an excellent route runner. He plays faster than his 40 time. Um, he really does specialize on the in-breaking routes, and, and McVay loves those. It'll be interesting to see who lines up across from him. Is it going to be Mooney Ward? Is it going to be Lenore? Is it going to be Ambry Thomas? Uh, Puka Nakua is not usually a slot receiver, um, so it's not going to be someone being Isaiah Oliver primarily, but Ambry Thomas got benched last week. Who is going to be lined up across from Puka Nakua? Uh, in my mind, if you're just saying, you know, how would you line things up primarily, you have Mooney Ward on Van Jefferson, shutting him down the entire game, taking him out of the game. You have Lenore playing slot against Tutu Otwell. And then you let guys like Gibson and um, Ambry Thomas and even Ufunga on certain plays guard or help guard P uh, Puka Nakua. Um, this is not an offense I point to and say they're dangerous uh, when it comes to aggressively pushing the ball down the field. But Matthew Stafford is going to take shots. Um, he took a handful last week, but again, this is not a receiving core. I point to and say, they're going to go up and get it. They're not going to play 50, 50 ball with you. And if they do, it's likely not going to be successful against this defense. Um, Tutu Otwell is much more of the slot receiver. He's fast. He's quick. Um, if there was one player I am concerned about beating me, it's not Nakua. It's not Jefferson. It's Tutu Otwell. Um, if the San Francisco 49ers play Isaiah Oliver at any point on Otwell, uh, I'm going to be biting my my nails because he is someone that can burn Oliver really, really quick. Um, Otwell has blazing speed. We're talking elite level speed out of the slot receiver position. And if he's going to catch a football, um, he has a good chance of making something happen with it after the catch. Uh, I mean, we're not talking Tyreek Hill level speed, mind you, but we're talking really like Raheem Mostert style speed where he was just one cut and gone. Otwell's smaller than Mostert. Um, I think he's even smaller than Tyreek Hill, but he is so freaking fast where if it's if it's him and Oliver across from him, uh, I'm going to say, can we get some help? Can we please get some help over there? Uh, but again, besides that, like, Van Jefferson doesn't have great ball skills. Um, he's playing on a you know his contract year. He wants to have a big game. I don't think that's going to happen on Sunday. Um, he's really that kind of the dig and post route runner, but 
he's not going to burn you downfield. Puka Nakua, um, a lot of over the middle stuff with him. And again, Fred Warner's right there. <laughs> um, Hufanga's right there. This is not going to be a game where the Rams' strengths line up against San Francisco's weaknesses on defense. And, and I truly do think that um, the Rams are riding high off the week one win. Yeah, so are the Buccaneers. And I'm not saying those teams are equivalent. I think the Rams are much better. The Rams could easily win seven through nine games this year and beat the Seahawks out for a wild card, but um, they're going to have a hard time beating the literal best team in football on paper. And through one game this year, the best team on the field. Um, San Francisco has won, what, nine straight games with Brock Purdy, as, uh, eight straight games with Brock Purdy as a starting quarterback. And that's not going to end on Sunday against the Rams, barring something insane happening. Um, then you have players like Tyler Higby, which he's fine. I mean, he's not going to do much with Greenlaw and Warner and Hufanga guarding him. Um, and the Rams cannot run the football. If you can't run, it's going to be, hey, Stafford, play action. Hey, Stafford, five wide and beat us. And my money's on San Francisco having the edge in that market. Their defense is too good. And then that flips things to the offense. How can San Francisco's offense succeed? We spent half an hour talking about how's, how the Rams' offense is not going to score a lot against his Niners' defense. Now I'm going to tell you how the Niners' offense can put up big money points against this Rams' defense. I know the Rams fans are sitting back saying, did you see how good we were against Seattle? Do you see? Like, we held Geno Smith and Kenneth Walker and DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett to nothing. Yeah. And, <laughs> like, the fact that as Niner fans, we're supposed to sit back and fear any team that beats another team that we literally beat three times last year and then play a team we swept the previous year and have swept the previous four years and say, oh, I'm scared. It's like, no. Like, you beat Seattle. Cool. Do it three times this year, then come call us. And it's not to say the Rams didn't play well. They did play well. But their defense is not great, led by Raheem Morris. Um... It's a very Vic Fangio style of scheme, very quarters heavy split safety, but that's vulnerable against the run and everything underneath. We talked about how the Rams offensive strengths do not match up against the Niners weaknesses. That's almost the exact opposite for San Francisco. Our strengths underneath stuff, intermediate routes, um, running the football, mind you, with Christian McCaffrey, that's the Rams' schemed weaknesses. <laughs> like the Niners are sitting here saying, "Oh my goodness, um, are we talking 200 yards on the ground?" We've seen this exact same team minus Christian McCaffrey run the football 40 times and win the football game against this exact defense that has worse players on it this year. But again, we're supposed to be scared. We're supposed to be. You know, the Rams may have a chance. If the San Francisco 49ers do not win this game or put up 30 points, it's going to be a letdown. Like, I'm talking this game should be 33 to like 10 by the end of the fourth quarter. The Rams are a fine team, not in the same ballpark as San Francisco. Um, there is one weak spot, though. That I point to and say, okay, like that, that might be a concern when it comes to protecting Brock Purdy or in run offense and in run blocking. Um, it's Colton McKivitz and Spencer Burford. Um, Colton McKivitz gave up three sacks and five pressures against the Steelers, and Spencer Burford had two pressures. So seven pressures, three sacks allowed from the entire right side of the offensive line. And you're playing Aaron Donald one of the, if not the, best defensive player of all time. My mind leans to Lawrence Taylor still, but Aaron Donald's still one of the best to ever do it. And again, San Francisco, Aaron Donald has had success. Um, 12 and a half career sacks against San Francisco, 10 and a half being against Kyle Shanahan-led teams. But the last time the 
greatest defensive player of all time had a sack against San Francisco November 29th, 2020. That means one of two things. One, it means he's due and going to have like five. Or the other one being Shanahan knows how to avoid and almost eliminate Aaron Donald as a presence in this game. We have seen Daniel Brunskill body up and make Aaron Donald call him daddy. You know, we have seen Aaron Donald say, who? Who's that? Who's number 19? And then Debo Samuel annihilate the Rams defense, which doesn't even have Jalen Ramsey this year at cornerback. And trust me, we will get to the secondary because, oh my goodness, they might be the worst group in the NFL. Um, but Aaron Donald, last year, getting a little older, took a step back. Now, by all means, Aaron Donald's step back is still all pro style defense, but he's playing with the weakest group he's had since what, 2018, 2017, before their championship run against the Steelers. Um, like, <laughs> I'm sorry, Aaron Donald is older, still really good, but not as good as he was the past couple years, and he's going to be asked to do more. And the last time the Niners played the Rams with Banks, Brendel, and Burford, those three players only allowed four pressures. History leans Niners. On paper, leans Niners. Say it with me. This game, this year, is going to lean Niners. Like, I don't get, like... Rams fans have every right to be. The media there too. I want to give them respect. They have every right to say, well, we have a better team than you think. Yeah, you might. Just not this Sunday. <laughs> um, like, we've seen a very confident Rams team before come in and blow a massive lead against this offense led by a different quarterback without this running back. Like, we've seen worse Niners teams win more games by 10, 15 points against better Ram defenses. And by all intents and purposes through eight games, they have a better quarterback now. And you have Christian McCaffrey, who had three touchdowns running, passing, and catching against this team last year in his basically team debut. Like, my goodness, folks. I I'm talking shellacking. Um, but this defensive line for the Rams, they're young and they're really raw. Byron Young looked really good against Seattle on Sunday. Again, not playing against Trent Williams or Aaron Banks, mind you. And Seattle has a fairly good offensive line. Abraham Lucas got hurt. He's pretty good at the right side. So it's not like they played against scrubs. But a Geno Smith-led offense is not that good. It's not that good. <laughs> Whereas a Brock Purdy led offense is putting up 30 points per game so far through his first eight games. Um, then you have guys like Bobby Brown and Michael Hoke, and there's just nothing much out there that makes me go, the Rams have an advantage. Now, we have seen Cinderella stories play out, and you know, being in the Bay, we've seen baseball teams certainly do this. We've seen the We Believe Warriors do these things too, where if you're not supposed to win and you're not supposed to be here and they go on and have a lot of success, that's fine. But this is almost like back in the heyday of the NBA, or at least my heyday, the Warriors dynasty heyday. This is like the LeBron James led Miami Heat and Cavaliers with Kevin Love and Kyrie and Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh playing the Atlanta Hawks who they swept almost every single year. <laughs> like, that's what this is like or the Raptors during that same time. This is going to be a, a complete quarter-to-quarter, -quarter, just San Francisco, ground and pound, 14 points, touchdown, touchdown, touchdown. Like, and if it's not that, I'm going to sit here and say, what happened? I, what, what, you should have killed them. <laughs> um, but, like, San Francisco's offense leads the NFL and EPA by a large margin after week one. Like, they are not, like, the Rams are not playing a Seattle team, which by in itself is likely going to take a step back this year. Like, they're younger, they're maybe more aggressive, 
but they're changing schemes. Can Geno Smith replicate what he happened last year? I don't think so. The Rams are not like, not playing that team. The Niners should be better this year. Take steps up. The Niners got better on paper. The Rams got worse on paper. The Seahawks got okay on paper. Like the Niners made massive improvements. Um, and even last week, the Rams against a fairly good run offense in Seattle who for whatever reason abandoned the run in that game on 15 carries Seattle had 75 yards averaged five yards per carry I don't know why they didn't keep going and using that there's no reason why Cam Akers had 22 yards per or 22 attempts and Kenneth Walker had 15 um now my question would be hey you listening hey you watching um, if the Seattle Seahawks, with a less efficient offense, worse run blocking, a worse quarterback, and a worse running back, had five yards per carry, meaning that two plays equals a first down, um, what is the odds they can hold back Christian McCaffrey, who averaged 6.9, seven yards per carry against the Pittsburgh Steelers? I'll sit here. I'll wait. Um, not very high. The Niners. I don't care if it's Christian McCaffrey or Elijah Mitchell or Jordan Mason or freaking TDP or Kyle Juszczyk. They should have success against the Rams run defense. Um, the Rams also, which funny enough, they can't block the run. And they can't guard the middle of the field. Kyle Shanahan's like, do these idiots know what I like to do? The fact that the Rams, who had a ton of draft picks this year, not a lot of money, but a ton of draft picks, sat back and said, Ernest Jones and Christian Roseboom, we're okay with those guys playing linebacker on this defense. I mean, these guys are... We talked about last week the Steelers having three just really bad pass coverage linebackers. Cole Holcomb, Elander Roberts, and Keanu Neal mixing there kind of help those guys out. Um, the Rams do have the worst pass coverage linebackers in football. These guys are awful based on last year's tape. Um, now, to be fair, Jones, a much better run defender, but against the pass, a freaking liability. And Roseboom... He's in year three. This is his first time starting. You are almost asking Kyle Shanahan to say, okay, we will live in the 15-yard range intermediate passing game and eat you a little alive. Like, come on. George Kittle, Brandon Ayuk, Debo Samuel. Like, oh my goodness, the Rams. Like, I've seen Rams fans on Twitter be like, these are the keys to success. Matthew Stafford plays amazing. 50-50 quarterback is throwing up deep passes left and right. Choose the clock out. How can you chew the clock out if you can't run the football? How can you hit deep passes over the top when you are not going to likely be able to hit passes over the middle? Like the Rams are almost going to have to be reliant on the home run ball in this game because they're just not going to be able to move the ball consistently. And again, for two weeks in a row, we pointed to defenses that, you know, have, or the Steelers have a really good defensive line that has two amazing edge rushers. The Rams have none. The Steelers, Cam Hayward, who got hurt and hope he gets healthy, but have a pretty good interior defensive line. Now, the Rams have Aaron Donald, but that's one player of three. Now, you can double-team Aaron Donald, and the rest of those guys are not going to beat our offensive line 1v1. It's just not going to happen. And if you, if they happen to do it, you just put Kittle on the inline tight end and say, okay, now go stop Brandon Ayuk. You can't. Oh, Debo Samuel, you can't. Christian McCaffrey, you can't. Juwan Jennings, you can't. The Rams' defense... <laughs> Like, last week, Patrick Peterson said the Niners' offense has tells. And Brandon Ayuk cooked them. 
And Patrick Peterson, he's not that he's older, but he's not that bad. He's fine. He's a fine cornerback. The Rams cornerbacks. Oh my goodness. How did they sign off on fielding this team? Like they're physical and they play fast, like most young players like to do. They're undisciplined. They're going to rotate all these guys in and out. Darian Kendrick, he's going and can get beat over the top consistently. If a Kyle Weatherspoon plays, which, hey, DK Metcalf, you freaking jackass. Why are you trying to hurt people? Like, what are, you, what, are, what are you doing? Go on Twitter and find the clip. DK Metcalf cheap shotting Witherspoon on a play which they are nowhere near the ball. Suspend him. He's actively trying to hurt players. Play smash mouth, hardcore football, all you want. There is no room in the NFL for cheap shots in an already physically tasking game. Get that guy on the bench for a week or two. It's disgusting, and don't do it. Back to this game. If Witherspoon does play, he's probably their best cornerback, and he may have the size to go up against Brandon Ayuk, but Ayuk's the best running receiver in football. He can, he does get the most consistent separation in the league. He had Patrick Peterson on freaking press coverage, and he got five yards of separation instantly in the end zone. There is no matchup that is a successful one for the Rams. And even a player like Kobe Durant, who I think Rams fans really like, who I do like, but he's not going to out-physical someone like Debo Samuel, George Kittle. Like, there is nobody I point to on the Rams outside of Aaron Donald and say they have a matchup favoring them. And even Aaron Donald, like Shanahan has done the past, I don't know, since 2020, he has almost taken him out of the game entirely with what he does on the passing side of things. And so, if you want to point to Jordan Fuller on the Rams being someone, you can say, well, he's a solid NFL starting player. Sure, jack of all trades, master or none. But then I look five yards to the other hash mark to the left and go, oh, hi, that's Russ Yeast. We were talking about someone that uh, he just can't cover anybody. Anybody. Like, the Niners, which aren't known to be a a pass-heavy, down-the-field type of offense, right? They're much more intermediate, 15, 25 yards. You know, we're not seeing 40-yard bombs, Mahomes-like, Burrow-like downfield. If there's a game to try it, it's this one. If there's a game for Brock Purdy to open that gate up and let that thing loose, it's this one. The Rams can not cover anybody. Darian Kendrick, over the top, going to be open. Russ East, night-night. Steph Curry, night-night. Like, my goodness. Like, for Brock Purdy last week, he passed with flying colors against the, the Steelers. Had a handful of elite plays. Some things to clean up, certainly, but we all left that game saying, oh my goodness, um, he's looking like the guy and looking like one of the top guys in the NFL. Um, playing a much, much better, much more prepared defense in the Steelers that has elite players in certain levels, Wad and Hayward and Highsmith and even Minka Fitzpatrick. Um, they have players on each layer of the defense besides linebacker, the Rams have one player on the entire def defense you circle and say, stop this guy. Everything else, everyone else, is basically a, liabil a, a liability. I can't even talk because the words are so hard to say because I'm shaking about how much this offense can score against the Rams defense. I mean, he had, Purdy had an A-plus last week. He can have an A++ this week. We're talking about he passed the test against the Steelers. Fast forward a week, it's almost like the NFL. Kyle Shanahan said, here's the test. Also, here's a cheat sheet. Here's the open book. Go. Like, <laughs> like Brock Purdy should, like, Kittle should have a much better game than last week. 
Brandon Ayuk should just eat every cornerback against him alive. And Debo Samuel, could we see a Debo Samuel Rams performance again where he's just bodying people left and right? This team gets up for the Rams. They got up for Pittsburgh because they wanted to make a statement that, hey, week one is finally here. We are going to smack everybody in the mouth. San Francisco is going to get up even higher for this game, and they are going to want to not only smack the Rams in the mouth, but also punch their teeth in. This team is so freaking ready to annihilate the Rams. Oh, you're riding high. You beat the Seahawks. We swept them last year three games. We're going to sweep you again. You are going to have no chance in the NFC West. And mind you, if San Francisco wins this game, they will have not only be 2-0, but they'll be in first place in the NFC West this year. This game, I'll say 33-10, Niners win on Sunday. SoFi Stadium, Levi South. Um, this offense should annihilate, crush, kill, whatever word you want to put in there and say that's a good thing. This Niners offense should do so on every single level of the defense. The Rams defense cannot hold a candle to what the San Francisco offense wants to do. Chris McCaffrey should have another big game. Um, he can have two touchdowns at 120 yards, and I go, that's it? That's it? And I'm not like, this is not me being a homer and saying we should kill everybody. This team, well, should be everybody, but <laughs> but... What I'm telling you is that this Rams team is so bad. This Rams team, on paper at least, and what they showed last week, nah, like they, they should be in the um, the NFC South. How bad they are! Like one of the worst rosters in football, and their only saving grace is Matthew Stafford. That's really it. So I think Niners win thirty-three to ten. Claim a 2-0 record, advance to uh, the number one spot in the NFC West and have their two-week NFC crown placed on their head and, in my opinion, probably aren't going to give it up. Um, there's a good chance that San Francisco leaves on Sunday, not only being 2-0, but also watches the Seahawks be 0-2, watches the Cardinals be 0-2, and watches the Rams be 1-1, and then going into Thursday against the Giants, you're kind of hoping for a big game from the offense and defense. This week, allow you to rest your guys late in the game and hopefully get yourself ready for a short week on Thursday against the New York Giants and the actual home opener. But this Sunday might be that real home opener against the Rams at Levi South, redding out the entire stadium. Because for whatever reason, they said, we're going to wear our home whites which doesn't make sense knowing how much the Niners fans travel. And look, if you want to go to that game, use our promo code 49ers access 49 E R S A C C E S S at seatgeek.com and save yourself $20 off your first purchase. Again, you want to go to that game, get your red on and use that promo code and save yourself some money. You can also follow us on social media at 49ers underscore access is the Twitter. 49ers dot access is the Instagram. We're going to be watching that game on Sunday. Follow along with us there. Also, after the game, turn your radios on. Turn the Odyssey app on to 95.7 the game. Myself, Alan Styles, and Mark Grandy are going to have you covered for three hours discussing this Niners hopeful win on Sunday over the Rams from around 4 o'clock to 7 p.m. at night on the West Coast. And one last thing, you can use our Fanatics link up above or down below and buy yourself some merch and support the show. In the meantime, my name is Sterling Bennett saying have a wonderful week two of the NFL season, and hopefully we're celebrating a Niners win over the Los Angeles Rams in our semi-home opener down at Levi's South again at SoFi Stadium on Sunday against the freaking Los Angeles Rams. My name is Sterling Bennett saying thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe. 
leave that review. Almost at 500 YouTube subscribers. I want to get there before the end of week two. Really appreciate if you told your friends and told your family to subscribe to the channel. Podcast videos all year long. This has been the 49er Access Podcast. And until next time, stay faithful.